Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast. I'm Jonathan Farrow, along with Lisa Abramowitz and Anne-Marie Hordern. Join us each day for insight from the best in markets, economics and geopolitics. From our global headquarters in New York City, we are live on Bloomberg Television weekday mornings from 6 to 9 a.m. Eastern. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify or anywhere else you listen. And as always, on the Bloomberg Terminal and the Bloomberg Business app. Jay Pulaski of TPW. Jay, remember when summer was boring? Wasn't that great? There is nothing boring about this right now, is there? No, not at all, John. It's been really a, a crazy market just in the last couple of days, going back the last couple of months. I mean, when, when you talk about just as the crescendo about a narrow market and bad breath reaches its peak, right? Boom. Massive reversal. Huge move in small caps that we can talk about throughout this morning. Need to talk about the politics as well, Jay, so let's get into it. The former president addressing the Republican convention a little bit later. We need to talk about the pressure building on Joe Biden. The dam is breaking big time, and I'll go through just some of the reports we've had. Not in the last 24 hours, in the last... 12 hours. This from ABC News, reporting that both Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and Minority Leader of the House, Akeem Jeffries, have indicated to the President it's time to step aside. CNN reporting that former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi has basically told President Biden the same thing in private conversations. Semaphore yesterday afternoon as well, Jay, reporting that the campaign funding is essentially drying up. Has the pressure ever been greater on this president? Yeah, it's interesting, right, John? Because I think Joe Biden is a fighter, and uh, this is all making him dig in, seems to be the case uh, so far. And what's really surprising to me is you have this massive push, uh, but on the other side of it, you have things like 538 in their polling on the Electoral College, which suggests Joe Biden today, if the election was held today, Joe Biden wouldn't win with 277 electoral votes versus 263 for former President uh, Trump. And yet that seems to get lost in the perspective. The other thing that I think is really powerful, and I know we're going to talk about it over the course of the hour here, is that the, the economic policy mix between the two candidates is night and day. And one of them is very constructive for the United States, as I believe, and the other is very destructive from an economic point of view. Would you like to tell us which one's destructive and which one's constructive? Uh, well, it's not just me, right? I mean, if you look at Goldman Sachs, if you look at Moody's, if you look at the Peterson Institute, if you look at 16 Nobel laureates, all have come out and said that Donald Trump's plan is uh, bad for the United States. It means uh, lower growth. It means higher inflation, right? You have mass deportations. That throws a wrench into the labor market. You have tariff uh, hikes. You have uh, extension of fiscal uh, of tax cuts. You have essentially fiscal incontinence. And I think it sets up the real risk of a dollar crash, which uh, sets the stage for a reversal of what has been a 15-year run of massive U.S. financial asset outperformance. A dollar weakness appears to be the objective of the incoming administration if they win. Are you saying that U.S. exceptionalism dollar dominance is going to be questioned come November if Donald Trump wins. Absolutely. That's, I think that's the case. And you're already starting to see it a little bit right now. It hasn't really manifested because I think notwithstanding the, the kind of the frenzy around Joe Biden, the polling is not at all a suggestive of the same, right? Polling is extremely tight within the margin of error across the swing states as well as nationally. And so that's why I think the market hasn't quite moved in this. But it really does set the stage for things like, okay, does this small cap rally have legs? Does this broadening out of the equity market, is it sustainable? Or do we run kind of hard into the fall and then get smacked in the face with uh, a, a Trump victory that leads people to question the policy mix of the United States and the Fed gets put in a box, right? Because the Fed is going to be cutting. I think yep. that's pretty clear. But if we get this situation, this worry, the dollar starts to fall. The Fed has to raise rates. The dollar continues to fall. Rates have to go higher. And look, we're, we're, in a, we're in a bond market that has not broken out. Equities have clearly broken out. And by the way, it's global, right? It's not narrow. It's not the Magnificent Seven. Acqui, all country world, all-time highs. IFA, all-time highs. Acqui XUS, two-year highs. Emerging market, two-year highs. Okay, so we're, we're in a situation where the other countries are starting to do reasonably well. 
And here we call into question the policy mix of the United States in a massively overowned asset, right? Everybody is overweight U.S. equities. Everybody is overweight U.S. treasuries, okay? So you have things like the yen. Fair value is considered to be 100. It's now at 156. You look at the euro. Fair value is considered 120. It's at 109. You look at emerging market currencies, absolutely bludgeoned. So I think there's, uh, it's not yet percolated in the minds of folks, but we got to be careful what we wish for. If we wish for a weaker dollar and we get a weaker dollar, then I think that suggests that the U.S. is not going to be the place to be uh, for the next several years. We've got a stronger dollar on the screen this morning. We're firm about a tenth of 1% on the dollar index. We've got a lot to talk about this morning too. Through the hour with Jay Pulaski. Your record market on the S&P 500, just a touch firmer, trying to crawl back inching higher by just two points on the S&P, up by 0.05%. In the bond market, yields creeping higher, back towards 4.20, 4.18.27. We can talk a lot about foreign exchange, the euro a little weaker, going into that ECB decision a little bit later, euro dollar at 109.30. Coming up this hour, Anne-Marie joining us as Democratic leadership pushes Biden to step aside. Sheila Kaolu of Jefferies as deep discounting hits the airlines, and Luke Hickmore of Aberdeen looking for a super September for global rate cuts. We begin with our top story. Biden can't catch a break. Just as illness forces the president to leave the campaign trail, the dam breaks. ABC News reporting both Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries have indicated to President Biden it might be best to step aside. Anne-Marie joins us now from the RNC in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Anne-Marie, before we get to the events of where you are, we need to talk about what's happening elsewhere. How great is the pressure on President Biden to make a move? It's intensifying, that's for sure. Over the past 24 hours, he had a really rough 24 hours, not to mention that uh, the White House came out and said he tested positive for COVID-19. It is not just Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer going to Rehoboth Beach over the weekend telling him, we think you need to step aside, or the fact that Hakeem Jeffries as well, the House Minority Leader saying to the president, if you stay in this race, this is going to hurt down ballot. This might mean we can lose the House. But then you have former Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, according to CNN, according to Politico, also having a direct conversation with the president saying, look, your polling shows that this is going to be uh, a loss against former President Donald Trump, and you are going to really uh, ruin the ticket for House members. So these are three top Democrats. Now, they're not saying this publicly, although if you read their statements of denials, these are not exactly straightforward denials to the press that these conversations took place. But what you are seeing is top three Democrats, especially Speaker Pelosi, who's very close to the president, telling him directly, face to face, that we think you need to step aside. Now, the president is now isolating. He's back in Delaware. And I think the next few days, we should note who he is meeting with. Is there going to be a family powwow? And could this potentially, could he heed these calls and step aside? At the moment, though, it does sound like he is defiant. When you ask the White House what is going on, they say, this is his race. He's sticking with it. He has the delegates. And he will be on the ticket November 5th. Yeah, Marie, I think that's uh, really interesting. Jay Pulaski here. I know we like to talk geopolitics. Um, you know, it's, it's funny. I, I think that Joe Biden is a fighter, right? And all this pressure is forcing him to dig in uh, deeper. Uh, you talk about the down ballots. It's interesting, right? Because when you look at the Senate races in the swing states, Democrats are polling considerably above the Republican candidates. So in the Senate, which is which is arguably more important for the Democrats to hold uh, than taking the House, uh, they actually seem to be doing well. Biden, truly, as you note, is not polling as well as those candidates. So I wonder if if we're not getting over our skis a little bit in talking about Biden uh, stepping away. Well, you're 100% right that Biden is a fighter. And this is a man who's fueled, really, by the complications in his life. And he talks about the trial tribulations of his life. And then he's always able to overcome it. He thinks he's still in the best position to beat 
Donald Trump. When it comes to some of these swing states, this is where he's really struggling. But you're right, a lot of this is in the margin of error when you look at some of the different polling. But that is why you see the concern of individuals on the ballot, whether they're running for Senate, whether they're running for Congress. They think that Biden is actually potentially going to hurt their chances. There's something else that I think we should take into consideration. Biden has changed his message three different times when asked what would it take to drop out. When he sat down with ABC in that interview, he said he could only be convinced if the Lord Almighty came down and said, Joe, get out of the race. Then the NATO press conference about a week later, he was pressed on this issue. I was in the room. This was all anyone cared about. And he said, no, there's nothing that can make me get out of the race, except maybe they came back and they said there's no way to win. The polls, he says if his team came to him and said the polls show there's no way to win. Then in an interview with BET that was on display last night, it was broadcasting, it was supposed to be this counter-programming to the RNC, he said if he had some sort of medical condition that emerged, if someone, if doctors came to me and said, you got this problem and that problem, anyway, he said, that would potentially be a reason why I drop out. So I do think there is a little bit more of wiggle room now because Joe Biden himself has changed the reasoning why he would get out of this race. And right after we saw those comments about the potential of a medical problem taking him out of the race, he gets a COVID diagnosis. Can we just look at the compare and contrast? It could not be starker. Saturday evening, an attempted assassination on the former president of the United States walks away from it with his fists raised, American flag waving in the background compared to say this. Amory, I understand it's brutal, but look at the pictures of yesterday evening, yesterday afternoon. President Biden contracting COVID, no mask, struggling to walk up the steps of Air Force One. A little bit later on this evening, this president won't be able to counter-program the former president of the United States when he addresses the RNC. How stark is that contrast going to be? It's incredibly stark because you also have a Republican Party that's trying to tone down the rhetoric at this RNC, and they're trying to unify, really, the MAGA wing of the party, this Trumpism that many hawks and many fiscally conservative and uh, more moderate Republicans were hoping, potentially, this would basically no longer be the brand of the Republican Party unless Trump was top of the ticket. But th yesterday, in that speech from J.D. Vance, that just showed that MAGA and Trumpism is here to stay. The populist wing of this Republican Party is now the majority of the Republican Party with this ticket. And this evening, we're just going to see that tonight with President uh, Trump coming to the stage and formally accepting his party's nominee to uh, face off against potentially what will be Joe Biden November 5th. And he's probably going to put his fist in the air and say, fight, 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 like he did after that former uh, that assassination attempt on Saturday. And then in contrast to President Joe Biden, who cannot counter programming because he's self-isolating in Delaware, and then it's just a drip treat of reports that members of his own party, senior members of his own party, and some of them who really love the president, like Nancy Pelosi, are telling him, we think it's time you step aside. Let's get into that address a little bit later. Let's talk about that and finish there. I want to talk about policy. On Wall Street, for a long, long time, we've always thought of the Republican Party as pro-business. And you and I have been talking about this now for a number of weeks. We've been talking about how pro-business this Republican administration may actually turn out to be. What is going to be in the address a little bit later to maybe settle that score on that front? Well, it's very different, I think, if you hear what J.D. Vance has to say, his VP pick, and what President Trump has to say. So J.D. Vance last night said this is no longer the party of Wall Street. This is the party of the working class. He called out auto workers in Michigan, factory workers in Wisconsin, and energy workers in Pennsylvania. Donald Trump likely chose him to park him in these three states to try to win the election. Because if Joe Biden cannot hold the Rust Belt, if he cannot hold the Blue Wall, then he is not winning re-election to see the White House again. But Donald Trump is going to go to the stage today after an interview with Bloomberg Businessweek, and he said he'd actually like the corporate tax rate at 15 percent. So I am struggling in all of my conversations here, and I had this conversation yesterday with Virginia Governor Glenn Youngkin, who they think Virginia is definitely in play when it comes to the Republican Party, about which 
Republican Party is good for business. And honestly, Jonathan, I still don't know the answer. It really depends who you ask, because someone like J.D. Vance wants to see a higher corporate tax rate, while the top of the ticket wants as low as 15 percent. So. We're still struggling to figure this out. One thing that I'm continuously told when I ask about some of the um, rhetoric from J.D. Vance about the business community, everyone says the same thing. It's Trump's party. J.D. Vance is going to get in line. AMH, on the latest at the Republican convention, Anne-Marie, thank you. Jay, that's a question we keep asking. Just how business-friendly is this government going to be if they get back into power? <laughs> Um, I, I think that uh, there's a clear distinction between the two candidates and their economic policy mix. Biden has been probably the most successful president in terms of economic policy and outcomes in 50 years or more, right? Um, and President, uh, former President Trump, I think, is uh, his policy mix is basically fiscal incontinence, where you're talking about mass deportation to destroy the labor market. You're talking about raising tariffs 60 percent. You're talking about uh, cu extending tax cuts. You're talking about cutting taxes even further. So I think the situation is setting up for really a, could be a significant shift and a significant surprise in terms of the dollar. Because if the dollar weakens when we blow out the fiscal deficit here, the yep. Fed is in a box. Uh, I think people start to get worried about policy confusion and chaos, which was kind of the motif of the Trump first administration. Then I think you have a situation where you have a massively overowned asset, which is U.S. financial assets represented by the dollar that could roll over. It's at 104, 103. Uh, people target 90 um, as a reasonable place if it really does uh, start to sell off. Jay Pulaski of TPW Advisory still optimistic right in this. They say rotation is the lifeblood of bull markets and it sure seems like a broadening out and rotation to X-Tech would go a long way to sustaining the bull. Jay's with us around the table through the rest of this hour. Jay, I want to talk about one name in particular before we broaden out ourselves. Mm. I want to talk about Taiwan Semi. Mm. Taiwan Semi gets hammered yesterday. But this is a company putting up real numbers. Just this morning, this is what we learned. They now expect sales to grow more than the maximum, mid-20% it had guided towards previously. Were these a buy yesterday for you? Yes, they were, uh, John. I think, you know, markets had really extended. You live by the sword, you die by the sword, right? So when you're up 20, 30 percent in a matter of a month or two, you come, you pull back 8 percent in a day. That's just kind of normal. But the point you're making is fundamentally these are solid, fast, rapidly growing stories, which are unique in the world, right? You're talking about uh, forecasts that were made a couple months ago, and they're already beating them and raising them. And this is a story we've seen with NVIDIA and other chip uh, makers that are involved in AI uh, for a year now, right? And so you've had massive moves, but the stocks are actually cheaper now than they were a year ago because earnings have outpaced the stock price appreciation. And so we have been and continue to be big believers in AI and big believers in the idea of the pick and shovel, right? The pick and shovel for AI is the semiconductor space. And so when you have pullbacks, those are opportunities to add in our view. So this is what we've been rotating away from in the last week. Let's Let's talk yep. about what we've been rotating towards, yep. small caps. We've had questions around this table, conversations about whether we're going into a small cap presidency with Donald Trump, the president in the White House, heading up the United States and driving small business in America and punishing big business, big tech in particular. How do you frame that one? Yeah, I, I look at it differently. I look at it that small caps are big beneficiaries of lower interest rates, right? 50% of small cap debt is, is floating rate versus 10% for large cap. So they are big beneficiaries. Beneficiaries. And so you, we've seen this movie. We saw it in the fall, right? Small caps had a 27% move in three months, October to December. I think they're set up for something similar. Uh, small caps today trade at 10 times 2025 earnings on a median basis. That is extremely cheap. They're massively under-owned, right? There's a massive short, which is why this has moved so fast, right? This is always the case, right? It's a massive short covering. But you have fundamentals, again, like TSMC, to support it. The other thing that I think is really, really interesting, John, is that things are broadening out, right? We just updated our model portfolios at TPW Advisory, and when I go through all the positions, all the indices, and all the things we're thinking about. And what's interesting to me is that thematics are breaking out, right? You look at biotech, you look at things like robotics, you look at things like security, cybersecurity. They're all breaking out to new all-time highs. You also look at things like infrastructure and CapEx, right? We saw the industrial production numbers yesterday. Infrastructure, PAVE, all-time highs. XLI, all-time highs. 
grid, which is uh, smart uh, energy uh, for the, uh, for the uh, grid system, all-time highs. And so to me, you're looking at a situation where there's multiple parts of the market starting to move in unison higher. And it's not just the Magnificent Seven anymore. And to me, that's a much more robust, much healthier market. Now, as we talked about at the open, whether with a Donald Trump, should he win, whether that sustains, I think is a very real question. That's a good thing, so long as we aren't going into an economic downturn. Just cyclicals, for an example. Let's take the likes of Delta, United in the last 24 hours. They're warning about discounting. Mm -hmm. They're warning about driving down prices going through the summer. That shouldn't be happening if this economy is holding up, should it? Yeah, it's so interesting, right? Because I, I, we were in airlines and jets uh, for quite some time as a reopening play coming out of COVID. And they really just didn't work. And they still don't work, even though you, you read about tourism, U.S. Uh, citizens going abroad in record numbers this year. And yet it obviously doesn't seem to be enough uh, for the airlines to make money. And so I, I think it's, it's, it's interesting, but I think it's an anomaly. If you look at broader issues, like you look at retail sales the other day, yep. consumer is still strong, right? You have, you have real wage growth, you have record low unemployment or close to it, you have uh, disposable income rising, and so consumption, I think, is, is, is fine. And what's interesting is, are we having the manufacturing sector starting to catch up and give us another leg? Andrew Jabra of Sockgen writing this. While recent data is supportive of rate cuts sooner than we anticipated, the market might be getting ahead of itself, pricing more than three cuts by January and nearly six cuts by the middle of 2025. Sabatra is with us for more. Sabatra, good morning. Good morning. The official house call at Sockgen was no cuts yep. this year. It feels like September might happen. Before we get there, I want to talk about the bigger view mm -hmm. from you and the team. Challenging really this view that once you start, they keep going. What's the pushback to that? Uh, the fact that the data has been relatively strong, right? It's, uh, it's something that the Fed has to kind of recalibrate as we go along. If you listen to what, uh, uh, you know, Fed Chair Williams, I'm sorry, um, Williams, uh, the New York Fed president said, he basically said that, um, you know, that they're trying to move into less restrictive policy. Um, so they're not really talking about embarking on a very aggressive path of rate cuts or even any sort of a, a, a you know a cadence of once a meeting or once a quarter. So they're going to be very very data dependent once they start. So you know kind of drawing the analogy with the ECB, they cut rates in June and and Sakchin rightfully called it a data independent uh, rate cut. Uh, so you know again coming into the end of the year, they're going to be faced with uh, questions about unit labor costs and how the data is progressing. So it's not certain to us that, that the ECB is going to be cutting every meeting. So the Fed might very well be in the same situation where they're going to have to recalibrate as we go along as they move away from, from restrictive policy. There might be something else they need to consider as well. And, and Robert Kaplan talked about it. If you're a current Fed official, you won't touch this subject. Former Fed officials can dance around it a little bit more, I guess. If new policies come out, it will take some time for them to digest those and that may affect their next decisions. How important is November as a date for how you think about 2025? So the November elections, I think, are very, very meaningful. Um, I think that after they, they cut in September, it'll be interesting to see uh, how they message uh, their policy path from there on. Um, you know, the market, I think, is, is aggressively pricing in for several cuts between, uh, between now and January. That feels like it's a little bit too much. Uh, but really, the outcome of the elections, I think, are going to be very key on how they, they think about policy uh, after uh, November. Um, so the, um, you know, the, the Trump administration is talking about, um, you know, higher tariffs. Um, you know, the debt and deficits picture is something that they're going to be very focused on uh, as well. So, um, you know, it's something that uh, the, 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 um, the, uh, the Fed is going to have to pay more attention to is not just the monetary side, but also the general trajectory for, for, the, for the fiscal side of things. You know, it's interesting because both the ECB and the Fed have had calls of being political, different flavors. For the ECB, it's that by cutting, you're acting as a kingmaker. You're letting these governments come in, run really high deficits, and again, you're saving them by cutting. If we're in a position where in November we get a Trump presidency, and we know that's going to be the policy, we know the deficit's going to be higher, and the Fed is still cutting, 
Is that a problem? Are they doing the same thing that's accused of the e that the ECB is being accused of doing? So, you know, the, the trajectory for debt and deficits is is uh, is quite dire. Um, regardless of who gets elected, whether it's, it's Trump or Biden, I think that that's something that the next administration is going to have to address. So it's not really the, the purvey of one uh, you know, uh, party or the other. Uh, and uh, I, I think that that's why I think it makes it very tricky for the Fed uh, to be able to cut rates um, you know, in an environment where uh, debt and deficits are, and, and long end yields could potentially rise if the market and the bond vigilantes start to uh, kind of push back on the, the narrative that's coming on, coming put forth by the administrations that come to power. Um, so I think that they're going to be very, very careful about uh, policy uh, adjustments. Uh, it's going to be more about moving away from restrictive policy as opposed to embarking on uh, several rate cuts. I mean, the last leg of inflation is going to be kind of tricky again. You, you're talking about uh, you know, inflation getting from 3% to 2%. That pathway is probably going to be a lot slower than people anticipate. So the first rate cuts um, you know, will kind of signal that they're willing to do more. But whether they deliver on that really depends on the data. Th that idea that you mentioned, that the bond vigilantes are going to come in if there's government spending that they don't like, to your point, we already know there's going to be a lot of spending. And with that backdrop, sure, there's been some curve steepeners, but we still get a 20-year auction yesterday that's absorbed really well. There's clearly still demand for duration. So how big of a risk do you actually think that is, that at some point this bond market might try to punish too much spending from the government? So at an environment where the data is starting to weaken, you are going to see uh, the market um, rallying and, and bond yields coming down. Uh, if anything, I'd say in the last you know three to four weeks, what we have seen is the market kind of getting ahead of itself, pricing in the Trump trade, the uh, five thirties part of the curve steepening out quite meaningfully. And in the last week, I'd say there's 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 been a little bit of a, a rethink and profit taking on those trades. And as the market positions for rate cuts, you're going to see that decline in yields heading into the elections. This has been our call all along: is that ten year yields will start to decline. We'll get ten year yields around four percent. Uh, by uh, the elections or at the end of the year. And then after that is when you'll start seeing uh, the, the sell-off led by the back end because of, of debt and deficits. There's really not any uh, willingness on either party to really um, address the debt and deficit issues. And there's not really that much room, I would argue, uh, for, uh, you know, for cuts in spending. Um, so it's going to be very, very interesting to see how the next administration deals with the issues on, on debt and deficits and how much the bond market is going to push back on, on that narrative. And that's an important phrase, debt and deficits. So let me get this right. You're running into November, your sell-off coming out of November. We've been trying to work out if we get high yields, is it because of a better growth profile, higher inflation, or because of supply? Do you think it's just about supply? Or do we get a higher bump of inflation as well? Do we get higher interest rates from the Federal Reserve too? How do you think about those other parts of this? So I think it's going to be a combination of, of factors, John. And I think you're right to point out that part of that could be because of the stimulative effects you're getting from, from rate cuts. So if the market starts to look towards, a, you know, especially at a time when the economy is relatively strong, this is a very unusual cycle. At least in my career, I haven't seen one where the Fed is cutting rates to to get policy out of restrictive territory and not cutting rates because we're heading into you know, some sort of a crisis or a meaningful recession. So in that sort of context, they have to be very, very careful. If they cut too aggressively, that could again lead to froth in the market. We've already seen an easing of financial conditions. You know, if you look at the equity market, it's, it's extraordinarily, uh, you know, it's performing really well. Credit spreads are very, very tight. So you're looking, and the dollar is very strong. So all of these uh, metrics lead us to believe that financial conditions are easy. So they have to be careful about cutting and not causing financial conditions to ease further. And if that would happen, and if growth actually starts to pick up, and we see, uh, see what we saw in the first month of the year, or first few months of the year, you could actually see uh, you know, yields rise. It's super unfair to ask for a number, but I've got to ask for a number. So we rallied down to 4% on tens. What do we sell off to? Are we threatening five again on a 10 year in America? Um, probably, at least our, our forecasts are for 10 yields getting back towards 4.5% by the middle of, of next year. Uh, again, uh, it's, it's uh, you know, the uh, policies put forth by the, uh, the administration to come is going to dictate how much of a, of a sell-off we see. Um, and it also depends on the trajectory for, for the economy. So a modest sell-off from here on makes sense for us to get from 45 to 5%. 
you're going to really need to see a, a, perhaps a further deterioration in the outlook for fiscal policy. Samantha is super thoughtful. It's good to see you. Thank you. Samantha Rajampa there of SOCGEN. Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo saying this, what looked like a pop last week has indeed become a rotation driven by Trump's polling and policies. We are confident regulatory pressure has crested and we upgrade banks to outperform. Chris joins us for more. Chris, it's good to see you. It's good to see you. This too. is a change for you in a short amount of time as well. It, it is a change, right? We didn't expect what happened this weekend to happen. And what that did, it made the probability of Trump um, taking the presidency um, from likely to highly likely. And then suddenly, we weren't talking about the fun fundamentals anymore. We were talking about policies. We were talking about tariffs. We were talking about taxes. We were talking about regulation. A and when you talk to people, and I'm sure you, you've had lots of conversations, you, get, you have 10 different, um, 10 different conversations, you get 10 different answers. Rates are going higher, rates are going lower, the curve's gonna steepen, the curve's gonna invert. Uh, we're gonna have inflation, we're not gonna have inflation. The only thing that we're confident in is that we've crested on the regulatory side. Right? It was already occurring with, with some of the things with Basel III, it was occurring with Chevron, but now that it looks like the Trump, Trump administration is going back in, it is something that we think is long and exploitable, which was a catalyst we needed to upgrade banks. How broad is this bank's call? Is it large caps and regional as one it, or the other? It, it's, it's starting with large cap, but really we like the banks, we like the financial space, and, and the regulation is going to help the group across the board. It's gonna help multiples, right? Ultimately, I think it's going to help earnings as well, but the issue is that it's multiples and you can start to price that in, and it's already beginning. We can talk as much as we want about trade and tariff, but the regulatory environment is already changing. So having a vice presidential candidate who talks about Wall Street barons, saying yeah. he won't cater to Wall Street, do you just write that off as campaign rhetoric? Um, I, I, I wouldn't. No, I, I wouldn't write that off as campaign rhetoric, right? There's going to be a lot of push and there's going to be a lot of pull. Um, J.D. Vance is, is new to the platform, and, and so there's going to be some, I think there's also going to be some growing pains, and, and he has very, some very strong opinions. Um, I, I, don't, I, I don't dismiss that, right? But what they talk about and what I think is going to come through and is coming through is it's America first. Right? And so it's domestic companies over global companies. There's a talk about being pro-cyclical, and so it, it's more about economically sensitive names, at least in the short term, th than your growth names. And also with the regulation, it's more about the capital markets, whether it's companies with M&A or IPOs, or just multiple revaluation re-val across the, the financial and banking space. In, in, in that trade of American companies right. versus abroad. It, full on display yesterday right. where you get the TSMCs of the world, those chip makers abroad yeah. falling, and Intel does fine. It kind of yeah. trades water. Does that kind of rally have legs? Um, I, so yesterday was a really interesting one because you're right, everything went down. And so there wasn't a whole lot of discrimination. And if you look across tech, there's certain tech more so on the hardware semi side that you would punish or, or weigh on a little bit more than you would on the services and software side. But everything went down. And I think it's just going to take a while for the market to really discriminate. And the other thing is we're going to, we saw this last time, we're going to have a number of iterations. There's going to be a number of things out in the public that we talk about. It's going to be 10%, it's going to be these companies, it's going to be that com uh, this industry, and it's going to change over time, and the market's reacting, but what the market is saying is, hey, we went from a likely um, change in administrations to a highly likely change in administration, a and the views here are much different, so we need to price those in. Just to get a bit of nuance for you, from you, and pin you down a little bit, yeah. what is the difference between sort of this traditional rotation and a pure Trump trade? What's the difference yeah. between the two? So, uh, traditional rotation, so I, I think there are two things. So last week, what we were saying, and, and we were wrong about this, hey, the, the rotation is not going to happen because it's not fundamentally driven. The fundamentals just aren't there, right? Because what we're seeing is, if you look at surprise indices, they're rolling over, right? If you look at, at the reaction to bad news, companies are reacting poorly to bad news. But then you had, had the weekend, and all of a sudden, the political environment just changed, right? And this week, it was all about, or almost all about, um, the political. So I think the only thing that's really long tailed in nature are things that touch that, that regulatory environment. As far as the fundamentals, we need to start digesting the fundamentals, and I still think the, the fundamentals favor your larger cap and your growth of your names. We'll, we'll see, right? Yeah. But until we see the fundamentals change, 
I'm still not entirely sure that you're going to see the broadening out that a lot of people hope. So let's park the banks, the yeah. regulatory story that you've yeah. got confidence on. I have noticed in your research, and I think this is a fair characterization based on what you've just said as well, a little bit nervous about incoming earnings so far. Yeah. The likes of Delta, what we heard yeah. from United yesterday, Pepsi yep. as well. What are you seeing in those stories? It, it's not great, right? So the economy is not as strong as I think people expected. And, and what you're seeing is, you know, if you look at the beginning of the year, a lot of economists, I think the, the forecast was for like one or one, one, two, and it doubled. But economic strength did not double. And what happened was people took out the recession forecast, right? It wasn't, oh my God, the, the economy is so strong. It's, eh, we're not going to have a recession, right? And now what we're looking at is, hey, we didn't expect the Fed to be as strong or, or, or as tight as they have been. And that, that's starting to eat into, in, into the psyche. What's also happening is you're having inflation fatigue. And you're also seeing that companies have been pushing price. And individuals are beginning to push back. right? And, and so now you really can't have, and, and what we say is the economy is not going to bail you out. People think the economy is accelerating. I just don't see it. And so we need things to slow down. And what we've had is we had a bump because of the, the Trump trade. But it's really not supported by the fundamentals. But there are people who say it's not the economy that's going to save us. It's right. the Fed that's going to save us. And we're going to get some Fed, right. Fed cuts, rather. And that means that for these small caps right. that have floating rate debt, they're all going to be saved. Yeah, it, fair point, right? So we were oversold. We had an oversold bounce. Um, now, this is probably the oddest easing cycle we've ever, I've ever seen, right? Typically, when you enter an easing cycle, things are really bad. The Fed's cutting because either there's a liquidity issue or the economy's slowing down. Here, they're just saying, hey, we're going to start cutting. So how are they going to cut? 25 basis points here, 25 basis points there. Is that really aggressive enough to change the economy? I don't think so. Is that enough to change an oversold condition to something a little bit better? Yeah, I think so. But until you see the economy starting to reaccelerate, it's really hard for those smaller cap companies that have a tremendous amount of balance sheet and operational leverage to outperform for a sustained period of time. Mid-cap growth. You've heard some of the simplistic sort of commentary we've heard over the last couple of weeks as well, which is sort of buy everything else, leave big tech behind, buy everything else. Right. Can you tell us not just what you want to buy, banks, what right. wouldn't you touch? What would you tell our audience this morning as everyone gets wrapped mm. up in the everything else rally? Yeah. What should they avoid? Yeah, so we're, we're still not fans of commodity and commodity-related stocks. If you're going to a period where inflation's lower, I'm not really sure how that works. Also, if we don't think the economy is accelerating, those are places where, where we don't want to be. So we're still underweight um, energy, and, and we think that's going to be a, a difficult spot. So anything commodity, commodity-related, you know, in an inflation or a non-inflationary environment, I just don't see how it works. Chris, it's good to see you. Up right in the banks. You. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Chris Harvey there. This is the Bloomberg Surveillance Podcast, bringing you the best in markets, economics and geopolitics. You can watch the show live on Bloomberg TV weekday mornings from 6am to 9am Eastern. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify or anywhere else you listen. And as always on the Bloomberg Terminal and the Bloomberg Business App.